Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And in today's podcast, we're covering Dinosaur of the Day, Edmontosaurus slash Anatotitan, depending on if you're a lumper or a splitter. We have a ton of dinosaur news, including three newly named dinosaur genera. And we would like to give an especially big thank you to our Stegosaurus patrons. Specifically this week, we'd like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Kyle and Betsy, Blaze Campbell, and Trent Carbajal. And Trent's new, so thanks, Trent, for joining. Yeah, and thanks to everyone who is a patron. We really appreciate all your support. If you'd like to join this amazing group of people, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. Yeah, and we also just launched a permanent Teespring store. We had that temporary shirt for sale for a while, but now we have a store with our logo on it that's going to be there for at least quite a while. (laughs) So if you're interested in getting a shirt or a mug or other clothes or a bag or a onesie (laughs) with our logo on it, we have them all up at our store. We did them all where we could in black because we thought it looked better with our logo. But if people want it in white or another color, you can let us know and we can add that to the store too. So jumping into our three brand new dinosaurs, the first one was published in Nature Communications, and it was by Xu Xing, Philip Curry, and Michael Pittman, among others. And it covers a new troodontid Jianyan Hualong Tengai, and it's named after the Chinese company Jianyan Hua, which helped fund the expedition, and a woman, Fang Fang Teng, who helped collect the specimen. Jianyan Hualong was around in the early Cretaceous, approximately 125 million years ago, and it's a very complete skeleton that they recovered, including feather impressions, the skull, some claws, the wishbone, and even the tail, which is covered in all sorts of feathers. They believe it to be an adult based on fused bones throughout the body. And the whole thing is only about 112 centimeters or 3 feet 8 inches long, and it had an estimated weight of about 2.4 kilograms or 5.3 pounds. Tiny. Yeah, pretty small, but it's similar to other troodontids from the area. And it's the earliest known troodontid with asymmetrical feathers, and that's what you need in order to fly. So combining that with the fact that younger meaning earlier in the Cretaceous, troodontids had longer arms than the ones that followed them. They got shorter arms. They think that that might mean that these asymmetrical feathers are kind of a shared characteristic with other groups. So there might have been multiple branches of dinosaurs that all had these asymmetrical feathers that might have been used for some kind of flight type thing, you know, either gliding or that wing-assisted inclined running or something like that. And they also found that these troodontids had feathers and a feather pattern that was similar to Archaeopteryx. They had that tail feather, big paddle looking thing, and then also lots of feathers on their arms slash wings, depending on what you want to call these things that it has on the front of its body. So pretty cool discovery. And it tells us a little bit more about troodontids and some other early feathered dinosaurs. The next discovery <laughs> that I want to talk about is by Emmanuel Schopp and Octavio Mateus, and it was published in Pure J. They describe a new diplodocid called Galeamopus papsti, and the genus was named by the same authors back in 2015 in the paper when they looked at nearly 100 sauropods and brought back the genus Brontosaurus. My favorite paper. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty good one. Yeah, so in that paper, they also named Galeamopus hei, which was previously known as Diplodocus hei, just like with Brontosaurus, how it, the species was previously under Apatosaurus. And Galeam means helmet and opus means need, which they chose because it literally translates to the German name Wilhelm. That means 
need a helmet in German, <laughs> which is the same as William in mm, English. That's what that means. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a weird... I'm sure there's some good reason for why that's the case, or maybe nobody knows. I don't know. But they did that because there were two different Williams, like men named William, who described it in the early 1900s. One was right when the discovery happened in like 1906, and then another one went back in the 20s and kind of made some corrections to the original discovery. So I checked, and I haven't seen any peer-reviewed criticisms of Brontosaurus or Galeamopus, so I think they might be holding up to scientific scrutiny, which is nice because Sabrina really likes Brontosaurus. Sure do. <laughs> that doesn't mean that there hasn't been a paper. I just looked through the 27 papers that cited it, at least their titles, to see if any of them were criticisms of it. Because usually if somebody publishes a paper that's like, I don't like that, it'll specifically say like criticism of and then, you know, the title of the other paper or, you know in reference to and then the other paper. So I didn't see any of that for Brontosaurus or Galliamopus. So back to Galliamopus Pabsti, the Pabsti part comes from Ben Pabst, who led the excavation of the fossil back in 1995 and then prepared it for mounting once it was at that stage. So he's pretty invested in this fossil. They found it in the Morrison Formation just on the Wyoming side of the border with Montana, so really far, far north central Wyoming, pretty much as middle of nowhere as America gets. <laughs> and it's about 150 million years old. They recovered over 20 vertebrae, lots of ribs, parts of the fore and hind limbs, and a foot, and a really rare find for a sauropod, they also found most of the skull, which nice. is great. And probably the reason that we can be so sure that it's a diplodocid, because it's got those peg-like teeth. And the narrow skull. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really does look a lot like diplodocus, which isn't surprising, considering it was synonymized for a while. Actually, it never had a name before being called diplodocus. It was always just a different species of diplodocus, until... Shop and Mateus got to it. <laughs> <laughs> the find appears to have reached sexual maturity, but probably not full adulthood since not all the bones are fused, so it might have had a little bit more growing to do. And it differs from Diplodocus with more robust legs, and it's got a different shaped neck. So the, the words that people use to describe vertebrae are so insane. It's like dorsal, ventral, it, it, so many prefixes strung together. And you can follow it once you're used to it. But anyway, it basically boils down to it had a more triangular neck near the head, meaning the neck was a little bit wider at the top and narrower at the bottom than other diplodocids because of these things that were sticking out of the vertebrae. Hmm. So this is just another sauropod that were thrown into this mix of already a ton of sauropods. We talk about different sauropods all the time, and they have these really minute differences. But in the paper, they kind of try to address that a little bit by saying that there's a really high level of diversity, but it probably worked because of, quote, spatial and temporal segregation of the species, as well as niche partitioning, end quote. So basically, they were in different areas, and since sauropods were around for about 100 million years, and one species usually lasts about 2 million years, there's plenty of time to have a whole bunch of different sauropods in that time range. And then the niche partitioning works because you have things like diplodocids with those peg-like teeth, and then you have chimarosaurus with the chisely teeth, and then you have the other dinosaurs that are almost like ruminids where they grind up the food. So yeah, it all works out. And if you're really into this dinosaur and want to see it, it's on display at the Sorier Museum in Switzerland. I hope I said that right, even though the odds are low. Maybe it's Sorier. Yeah, it could be. Switzerland, what, has like three languages, depending on what area you're four. in? Yeah, so uh, there's no chance. Um, <laughs> and it's been up there for quite a while. It's just been under a different name. It used to be called the Plodicus, and now it's Galeamopus. And just want to give a quick thanks to Luke and Brett who shared these links with us via Patreon and Facebook. Respectively. Yes. <laughs> and our last new dinosaur we're going to talk about today is a titanosaur 
And Sabrina, if I was going to tell you there was a new titanosaur discovered, where would you guess it's from? Argentina. Yeah, that'd be a good guess. But it's not. Also Africa, maybe the US, maybe Europe, maybe Australia. I think the last place I would guess is probably Asia, (laughs) (laughs) but that's the case this time. And specifically, this one was found in Russia, also kind of an unusual place for dinosaur discoveries. It's from the Mertoy Formation near near the border with Mongolia, and previously other dinosaurs have been discovered there, so it's a good spot to find some nice Mesozoic finds. It's about 200 miles north of Ulaanbaatar, which is in Mongolia, we were talking about the other day, but that's the opposite direction from the Flaming Cliffs. They estimate it being from the early Cretaceous within about 10 million years of 120 million years ago. It's a pretty broad range, but that's still pretty early for a titanosaur, no matter what end of that range you're in. And it's named Tengrisaurus starkovi, and Tengri is apparently the primary chief deity in Mongolian Turkish mythology. Hmm. It kind of reminds me of that giant emu dinosaur that got named in Australia, the emu god. Remember that one? No, I don't. It had the, because of the theropod feet, they thought it was a giant emu. Oh, yeah. And it was like the rule maker. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So Tengrisaurus is only known from three tail vertebrae, unfortunately. But the phylogenetic analysis that they did showed that it was near Rapetosaurus, which is kind of weird since that's from the latest Cretaceous in Madagascar, which is obviously very far in both distance and time. So the authors think that it might indicate that Titanosaurus arrived in Asia by the early Cretaceous, and even possibly that they originated in Asia. I think that's a little bit of a stretch since we see tons of titanosaurs all over Gondwana saying that they're from Asia. Might be a little early when you find three vertebrae (laughs) from maybe 120 million years ago. But it is a good point to say that, you know, it's a little more complicated than just all the titanosaurs were in South America and Gondwana in the early days. So it's interesting. Definitely. Speaking of interesting finds, the Utah Raptor Project shared some updates recently. A lot of video updates. Pretty cool. There's a video of the new equipment that they got from their GoFundMe campaign. And in that video, you can see a microscope that's attached to a really long arm so they can position it way out over the specimen. Nice. And there's also a light attached to the microscope. Nice. Can I be pedantic for a second? Sure. Was it a microscope or a magnifying glass? Microscope. Oh, really? That's what they said in the video. Huh. That's cool. I've seen a lot of those magnifying glasses with a light, but I don't think I've seen a microscope version. That sounds cool. Mm -hmm. They have another video that's a preparation update video, and that shows the work that's been done on the main Utah Raptor block so far. And you can see a maxilla. It's probably from a juvenile. And you can see teeth, including a replacement tooth that looks to be coming in, and also part of a raptor foot and femur. So some of the bones are missing ends, but it's possible that they might find them in the back wall and these bones were just displaced and not necessarily missing. The teeth in particular are delicate, so they need to be careful when they're getting it out of the rock. And Scott Madsen, who's working on it, said, quote, it just goes and goes and goes. Everywhere you try and go down and into the block, you hit more bone, (laughs) (laughs) which is pretty good. So Scott Madsen did both of those videos and we'll post links so you can see for yourself. And then last, Scott Madsen also did a progress report, another video on YouTube, at the Utah Friends of Paleontology annual meeting at the end of April. To recap, he gives the whole story of this Utah Raptor project. So a geology student in 2001 found the site at the Cedar Mountain Formation when he ran into a piece of bone that looked like a hollow arm bone. And Jim Kirkland and Scott Madsen went out to record the site in 2005. And when they came back, they found more bones and started collecting. Then Washington University from St. Louis came to help and pulled out a large block of iguanodon material. There was a rock fall on the site at one point. And picking through the material, they saw bone material stacked together, which was actually good kind of practice for what they're working with now. They found a lot of material, including a brain case. And because it took multiple years to dig up the bones, they had to put jackets on top of them to protect it during the rest of the year. Because in paleontology, you can only dig certain months out of the year during the right seasons, just because of weather and needing light. So summer is usually the best time. Unfortunately, these jackets were vandalized 
one of the years, maybe I think it was just one of the years. So somebody had peeled the jackets to see what was under them. So after that, they started making the site less visible. They used brown tarps to make it blend in more. And sometimes they bury the tarps too. Yeah. Eventually, they determined that they were looking at a quicksand deposit. It was really difficult to move the bones off the site. There's heavy blocks and a lot of cliffs in the area. And one of the ways that they decided to move it was with a big sled that they built. And this sled had to support a block that weighed 18,000 pounds. Reminds me of like the Egyptians moving those huge for chunks. the pyramids. Yeah, for the pyramids. <laughs> they show that on sleds sometimes. And sometimes they put them on like logs or something to kind of roll it. <laughs> well, so they had to drag this block about a mile and a half to oh, get it onto a flatbed and then take it to the Utah Geological Survey in Salt Lake City. However, they didn't have a lab big enough to get the block into. <laughs> they wanted to prepare it initially at the University of Utah, but the floors wouldn't have been able to support it. Oh, geez, that would have been bad. Mm-hmm. So luckily, the Museum of Ancient Life at Thanksgiving Point offered the space. They had the right equipment. They had a big enough area. They could support it. But there was still trouble getting this block into the space, so they had to cut it down a bit. And when they did, they found a lot of bones sticking out. <laughs> They had about two inches of leeway on each side when they moved the block into the building. (laughs) Wow. And the block sat there for about a year while the team tried to get funding. And then, as we've talked about a lot on this show, they started using GoFundMe, but they still need more money to keep it going. And they've started doing prep, but Scott Madsen does it as just volunteer work for now. And it's really cool because if you're at Thanksgiving Point, people can see the work as it's happening. That is awesome. Yeah, we missed that museum while we were in Utah. We thought that it was really far from Salt Lake City. And I think the night before we were leaving, we're like, yeah, we really need to get to Thanksgiving Point. And Josh Cotton pointed out to us like, oh, it's just like a half hour away. We're like, ah, crap. (laughs) We should have gone there when we had a chance. But we'll make it back sometime. Yeah, plenty of stuff in Utah. There is so much. Next, Sauropod Vertebra Picture of the Week recently shared a post about the Apatosaurus in the American Museum of Natural History. It was the first permanently mounted sauropod, and it consists of multiple specimens. Tom Johnson, who wrote the post, said that his favorite dinosaur was Brontosaurus. It's got good taste. <laughs> and a series of plastic model skeletons from the 1950s based the Brontosaurus skeleton on the American Museum of Natural History Apatosaurus. Which was named Brontosaurus for a while. Yes. So sometimes you can find skeletal reconstructions that compare the completeness of specimens by coloring the actual bones red. Yeah, or other colors. But it's always cool when you see that so you know just what you're looking at, how many of them were dug out of the ground versus how many had to be molded with artistic interpretation. Or coming from other specimens or something. Yeah. Yeah. And in 2005, Upchurch and others released a study of the 11 most complete apatosaurus specimens. So using those descriptions, Tom was able to color code this brontosaurus model to show the composite of the mount, how many different specimens were in there, as well as which bones were modeled or unspecified. And he also color coded based on illustrations from William Diller Matthews' book, Dinosaurs, from 1915. And this way he can show a visualization of the composite. And it's interesting. You see mostly one color red because most of it came from the specimen AMNH460, the one from the American Museum of Natural History. But there's also pieces from AMNH222, AMNH339, AMNH592, and YPM1980, which comes from the Yale Peabody Museum. Is that a tongue twister saying AMNH so many times? A little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The Sauropod Vertebra Picture of the Week is a really good blog, also known as SV Pow. Yes. <laughs> good name. Yeah. Speaking of dinosaurs. Of course. What else are we talking about here? Yeah. There's a follow-up to the paper that proposed how to classify dinosaurs. And this one was posted as a comment in Nature by Thomas R. Holtz. And he's a pretty big deal in dinosaur paleontology. So we talked about this about two months ago, specifically the proposal of Sauriscia and Ornithocelida as a new classification as opposed to the kind of traditional Sauriscia and Ornithischia. So as a quick reminder, Sauriscians 
include sauropodomorphs like brontosaurus and also smaller herbivores and all the theropods. So that's basically all the predators plus some weirdos like therizinosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> then ornithischians include all the herbivores that aren't sauropods, basically. So you've got stegosaurus, ceratopsians, hadrosaurs, ankylosaurs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So back in March, these authors redefined saurischia, which is pretty confusing because they use the same name, but they decided to classify it differently. So now they're proposing saurischia is sauropodomorphs and then a few Triassic carnivores like Herrerasaurids, which are just always difficult to classify. <laughs> and typically, Saurischia includes theropods. In fact, theropods are most of Saurischia. So what they did was they took theropods out of Saurischia and plopped them into a new group called Ornithocelida with all of the Ornithischians. So now you've got basically theropods and ornithischians in ornithocelida and the sauropodomorphs over in saurischia. But that's confusing because saurischia used to mean something else. And it's, I still had to look this up to remember what exactly they did because it's confusing. Anyway, in the new Tom Holtz article, he suggests keeping the ornithocelida name, which would still include theropods and ornithischians, but adding a new group named Pachypodosauria, which was coined by Friedrich von Huhn back in 1914. And in Pachypodosauria, we would put in sauropodomorphs and herrerasaurids rather than just reusing the name saurischians, and it makes it a lot less confusing. The biggest reason is if somebody's publishing a new paper and they mention saurischia, you don't know if they're referring to the old version of Saurischia, which has well over 100 years worth of scientific literature written about it, or the new version of Saurischia. Mm, that could get confusing. Yes, it would be incredibly confusing. It probably is already confusing for the papers that have been published since that one two months ago. And as Holtz points out, it would classify dinosaurs with four or more weight-bearing toes, essentially sauropodomorphs and herrerasaurids into this Pachypodosauria, and then all the three-toed animals, the theropods and ornithischians, would be in the other group. So it's kind of neat. It's not really that simple because you've got Therizinosaurus with four toes, because they just mess up all these things, and they're also herbivores. But I really like the idea of making a new name rather than just revamping Saurischia, because that's so confusing. I also think it's a really big deal that Tom Holtz is embracing the new classification and even proposing slight adjustments to it rather than just coming out against it, since the two dinosaur reference books that Sabrina and I look at the most often, he is the author on. So <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of a big deal <laughs> in terms of dinosaur literature. And yeah, it's it seems like we're going to have to get used to Ornithocelida. And hopefully... Pachypodosauria instead of Saurischia getting renamed. I really like this idea. <laughs> but we'll have to see if there are any comments on his comment. <laughs> Just goes on and on. And, and thus science continues. <laughs> <laughs> Next Daily Record shared a post about the marl pits in New Jersey. And marl deposits come from when part of New Jersey was the seafloor and green sand was deposited in bays and river mouths. And the marl has fossils from a lot of marine animals and even some primitive mammals and reptiles and birds. In colonial times, farmers found that marl was good for fertilizer and a lot of marl pits were dug. Then in 1838, one farmer in Haddonfield, New Jersey, found large bones in a pit on his land. About 20 years later, William Parker Folk, a fossil hunter, heard about the bones when he was on a vacation nearby. He called Joseph Leedy, who's his friend, to come by, and they and a crew excavated the bones. And these turned out to be the first nearly complete dinosaur skeleton. And it was called Hadrosaurus foci, named after Folk and Haddonfield. And it was the first mounted dinosaur displayed to the public. It was put on display in 1868 at the Academy of Natural Science in Philadelphia. Yep. And... New Jersey is still a great place for paleontologists, not necessarily for dinosaurs, but for marine fossils, including mosasaurs. And the site where this hadrosaurus, known as Hattie, <laughs> was found, is now a neighborhood. It's no longer a dig site. 
The exact location was unknown until a Boy Scout, Chris Breeze, found it again in 1984 using maps and Leedy's descriptions. And now it's marked with a plaque, and you can see it if you park at the end of a street of houses. And we have been there. There's <laughs> also a table full of dinosaur toys, and kids in the neighborhood use it to exchange dinosaur toys. Yeah. When we went there, there was nobody else around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like basically at the end of a dead end street, and it looks like any other, you know, little ravine that water runs down. We thought we were in the, the wrong year. spot. Yeah. Yeah. But there is a sign that you can kind of see from the road. It's not real obvious. And then there's a picnic table that has all these toys on it. And we were over there. We were trying to figure out how to set up a tripod to take a picture of ourselves near the sign. And a man and his son were coming over to play with the toys. (laughs) And they took a picture of us for us. And then we went to downtown Haddonfield for lunch and took a picture with the Haddonfield Hattie statue. Yeah, statue, which was really cool. Um, And then in a different trip, we went to the Academy of Natural Science in Philadelphia. Yep. And saw the original mounted. I don't know if it's original. I don't think so. I think it's... But they still have these bones or replicas of bones mounted. So you can see the original dinosaur style mount that Mm -hmm. was constructed. It's really cool. Highly recommended. Definitely. Plus Haddonfield uh, was a nice spot. It was a summer day. Yeah. Yeah. Haddonfield's nice. Next, Darren Nash wrote an introspective post on Scientific American about All Yesterdays, which is a book he co-wrote and illustrated with John Conway, C.M. Kozman, and Scott Harmon back in 2013. It came out around the same time as the movie Walking with Dinosaurs, just for context. And now Darren writes about the reliability of reconstructions of dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals. So Gregory Paul, a scientist and paleo artist, has greatly influenced the way that we see skeletal reconstructions of dinosaurs. According to Darren, quote, feathery theropods and fuzzy ornithischians have been portrayed with only the minimal amount of covering such that their skeletal outline is still visible. At its most extreme, the trend has resulted in zombie dinosaurs, where every bone in the skeleton is visible in the live animal. This method of applying the minimal amount of soft tissue to a reconstruction has become known as shrink wrapping, end yep. quote. <laughs> that is... A big problem all over the place. It's funny on Reddit, sometimes people post like the most shrink wrapped dinosaurs where like vertebra are sticking out of the back of some of these sauropods and, (laughs) you know, like things that would probably be muscle attachment points become spines. (laughs) (laughs) It can be pretty ridiculous. Yeah. So this book all yesterday's in it, they created shrink wrapped versions of modern animals, (laughs) hippos, baboons, whales, and they found them to look unrealistic. (laughs) That's great. I would love to see a shrink wrapped whale. (laughs) We should get the book then. I guess so. So it is possible then that fossil animals look unrealistic in this shrink wrapped way. On the other hand, there's an argument that there could have been a lot of variation with individuals in a species based on age, season, sex. But still, scientists may have underestimated a lot of things about dinosaurs, such as the thickness of their feathers or the look of ornamentation, frills, crests, spines, even how fat they were. So it could be that feathered theropods were completely covered in feathers that hide their skeletal form. The idea of All Yesterdays was to portray this alternative way of envisioning dinosaurs by showing, quote, the same sort of soft tissue covering we see in living animals. We also experimented with the portrayal of behavior, showing animals in unfamiliar and novel situations inspired by the behavioral diversity present in living species, end quote. The book All Yesterdays was independently published by Irregular Books, which is created and managed by John Conway and C.M. Kozman, and you can purchase the paperback for as little as 30 bucks in the ebook for $8.99. It's got a lot of positive reviews, so thinking about it, Garrett. Yeah, it sounds clever. I'm all about ebooks because we're out of space. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if it's a really good looking shrink wrapped hippo. Yeah. I want the print version. That's true. For art, print versions are still nicer. <laughs> and then for some of these older books, like I just bought a copy of The Dinosaur Heresies, that doesn't exist in ebook format. <laughs> no, really. I couldn't find it, at least. I think it's been out of print for like 20 years. Yeah, that's interesting. If it ever goes out of copyright, someone will turn it into an ebook. Yeah. How long have copyrights last? Like 100 years now? Yeah. So, whatever an ebook is in the future. <laughs> We've only got like 50 years to go now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technologies will change by then. Yeah. You'll look at it on some sort of heads up display or something. <laughs> And next, thanks to our listener, Ken, for sending us some information about his new Kickstarter project. 
It's called Primeval Kings, and he's already met his goal, which is really great. Congrats! Yeah, and it's an art book of different dinosaurs. So the highlight of it is a Stegosaurus fighting an Allosaurus, which is painted in color. And then he's got a lot of sketches that are black and white, and I've been seeing them over the last couple months posted on Reddit. And he was taking some feedback about how to adjust their proportions and things to make them more realistic, which is cool. Yeah, it looks like there might be some kind of feathers on that Allosaurus. Yeah, yeah, he definitely has feathers on some of the theropods. Yeah, it's cool. The description it says it. I really like how it starts out. This art book began its life approximately 65 million years after the deaths of its subjects, autumn 2016, to be more precise. <laughs> and he participated in the annual Inktober Challenge and Draw Die November. I think I've heard of Draw Die November. I didn't know about Inktober. It's funny because every time you talk about Draw Die November, you say you think you've heard of it. <laughs> You've oh, really? definitely heard of I it. I definitely have. And talked about it on the podcast I just before. don't talk about it enough. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So congrats, Ken. And if you're interested in supporting him, we'll put a link in our show notes. Yeah. And hurry, he's already sold out some of his reward tiers. So limited time. Yep. A few weeks back, we covered the news about the idea that tyrannosaurs may have had sensitive snouts that helped them with hunting and dealing with hatchlings and courting mates. An illustrator... Dino Puera from the Southern Ontario Natural and Science Illustrators Organization wrote about what it was like to help recreate that dinosaur, because Dino was the one to illustrate for the first time, and it was Displetosaurus hornerai. And he said that Thomas Carr asked him to help draft an illustration, which, quote, had a lipless face shrink-wrapped, here we go, <laughs> with large flat scales, end quote. And he also said, quote, since this is the first hypothesis proposed to show the facial integument of tyrannosaurs, I am thrilled to have been the first person to bring this awesome new vision to life, end quote. So it's pretty <laughs> cool getting a, that kind of inside look because you don't really hear too much about the artists who come up with these illustrations. Yeah, but that interaction between the paleo artists and the scientists who discover the bones is really interesting, and they both do add a lot to our understanding of dinosaurs. Definitely. Speaking of carnivorous dinosaurs, because that's what Displetosaurus was, <laughs> the Vividen put together a video list of large carnivorous theropods. And in order to be included in the list, it had to be a true theropod, according to the Baron et al. reassignment, and have a mass of 5,000 kilograms or more. This overview includes Tarbosaurus, which was around 5 tons, Acrocanthosaurus, which was 6 tons, Cacarodontosaurus, which was between eight and 9,000 kilograms. Tyrannotitan, around 6,400 kilograms, and a whole bunch more. And he gives the sizes of all the dinosaurs and some fun facts, like if they've appeared in the media. And then he lists all his sources in the video. So it's a good, quick overview. Cool. Brian Switek published a profile on Triceratops and how it wasn't as friendly as we might think, which it makes sense. It was a large animal. It had horns. <laughs> <laughs> So Triceratops, though, it tends to give off this friendly vibe, probably because it's herbivorous, and it's often portrayed facing off against a T-Rex. But Andy Farkey, a paleontologist, figured out that Triceratops was pretty aggressive by using scale models of Triceratops skulls to figure out the range of horn locks available to the dinosaur. From that, he could see evidence of Triceratops locking horns based on damage on their skulls. It wasn't anything from bite marks or other types of damage. It was probably similar to elk fighting. However, it's unclear why Triceratops fought, since not all Ceratopsians show signs of this type of fighting. It's possible it was over territory or mates or something else. Those seem like good guesses. That's the main thing people fight over. Definitely. And animals. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Next, Dinosaur National Monument in Colorado is has been reported as doing really well, so that's good news. So Nine News said that there were more than 300,000 visitors last year, and they spent over $18 million in nearby towns, including Dinosaur, Jensen, and Vernal. And this helped support 244 jobs, mostly in hotels and restaurants. Wow. Yeah, good to hear. Good old Jensen. <laughs> <laughs> Next, thanks to Kevin, who shared this one with us via Facebook. There's a TV show called Dino Dan that uses augmented reality to teach kids about dinosaurs, and it's augmented reality in the show. Like, you, you see the dinosaurs just on the screen. Hmm. So it features Trek Henderson, a junior dinosaur expert who imagines dinosaurs in the real world. And in one episode, he plays hide-and-seek and learns about microraptors. And the animation is 
pretty realistic. Kids also learn about dinosaurs as Trek interacts with them in his world. Got good reviews by the kids who watched them. Next, we've mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again. From now until July 16th, the Bruce Museum in Connecticut has an exhibition called Last Days of Pangea in the Footsteps of Dinosaurs, and it shows local discoveries and also features uh, coelophysis and dinosaur footprints. And if you're looking for a vacation spot this summer, you might want to try traveling the Montana Dinosaur Trail. We did that last summer. Or at least we started it. Yeah, started a very small portion of it. We, we got to three. Yeah. Three out of 14. That's not bad. Did we get a stamp at all of them? We forgot to get a stamp at one of them, so we got the same stamp from the... And then I think we forgot to get one at the last one, too. Oh, so we only have two stamps. That's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Well, it... Newstock reported on it this week with some details, and it, we've mentioned this before when we did it. Basically, you get a prehistoric passport, you get a stamp for each place that you visit. Remember to do that. <laughs> if you make it to all 14 museums, you get a t-shirt, right? Yeah, and you have to make it to all the museums, I think, within two years or oh, something. I thought it was five years. Oh, maybe it's five. Yeah. Five would make it more possible. Yeah. But I think in order to start, you pay like a dollar or five dollars or something for the little passport. And then if you want the t-shirt at the end, you send a letter or something, or you call somebody who manages it. Yeah. It's really cool. I've been to probably half of the dinosaur museums in Montana. But not within five years. No, <laughs> not within five years. And Sabrina's been to, what, like a quarter of them, I guess. Maybe a little less. Three. The three we went on last Three summer. out of 14. Yeah. I don't know what three fourteenths. It's about a quarter, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and a lot of these museums, they have events and digs. And one of the stops, Carter County Museum in Ekalaka, won a Montana Tourism Award. And we actually, we met people from that museum at SVP. Yeah. Yeah. I love these small museums because they're right in the thick of all the discoveries. So they always have really cool things and they let you touch a lot of the bones typically mm -hmm. too, which you can't do at the bigger museums because people would wear them out. Yep. But, Much more up close and personal. Yeah. Yeah, and it kind of has to be because the rooms that they're in, a lot of times you're really jammed in there with a bunch of them, like the Black Hills Institute, mm -hmm. although that one's in Wyoming. South Dakota. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Next, thanks to Chris who shared this one with us via Patreon. So there's a series called Flesh that has recently been released as a graphic novel. And Chris told us, quote, Flesh was a comic strip from the UK-based comic 2000 AD and was a staple of my youth in the 70s. <laughs> The series has just been released as a graphic novel. The link, he sent us a link, gives a short video introduction to the story. Dinosaurs and cowboys, what's not to like? And we agree. At least I agree. <laughs> yeah, it looked really cool. <laughs> it did. And I watched the video. And in the video, it said that the comic was created in 1977 by Pat Mills. And this world is controlled by corporations. And there's one company, the Trans Time Corporation, that sends rangers, such as Earl Regan, a cowboy, back to the past to farm dinosaurs for meat. Yeah. But, of course, the dinosaurs bite back. And it's described as, quote, visceral, violent, and very gruesome, and it mashes together cowboys and dinosaurs and the sight of dinosaurs regularly sinking their teeth into hapless victims. <laughs> it does have the title flesh, which is a little bit just kind of, what's that word? Graphic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gruesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the graphic novel is called Flesh the Dino Files, and it's now available in print for about $21. And it looks like it's going to be soon available digitally for $12.99. Next, Melbourne Mint in Australia launched a proof 5-ounce T-Rex $5 silver coin on May 2nd. There's only 500 pieces, and it was struck by Perth Mint. The coin was issued for Tuvalu, a Polynesian island. And the front of the coin shows Queen Elizabeth II, and the back shows this cartoonish t-rex with its mouth open and the words t-rex are also on the coin in this kind of cartoonish font the coin according to the website costs 495 dollars oh. probably australian dollars since you can buy it via the melbourne mint website but that seems That's like a lot yes yeah we bought a canadian t-rex coin for 20 dollars and it's a 20 dollar face value coin <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I wonder why this one's so much more. I think that one came with free shipping, too, because oh. they have a whole thing where it's like $20 for a $20 coin. <laughs> and yeah, it had a maximum of three, so we bought three. We still have to figure, we were going to maybe give those away or something. Yeah, and it wasn't cartoonish looking either. No, it looks really cool. 
But Canada and Australia have released a lot of dinosaur coins lately. Sometimes when they make a new discovery, they'll release a coin within a year or two. Yeah, that's pretty cool. U.S. should do that. Oh, yeah, they could do like a version of the quarters. Oh, yeah. You could do 50 easily. Mm-hmm. But you wouldn't be able to have a dinosaur from each state. You could almost. You could do a fossil from each state. That's true. And then just mostly dinosaurs, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. It would be. We should write our Congress people. <laughs> so next, Snapchat recently got another patent for Spectacles, which is its video camera sunglasses, and they show plans for augmented reality. The company seems to be planning to have glasses, visors, watches, and other items, according to the patent, along with an AR helmet and <laughs> AR glasses attachment. And there's no timeline yet for this, but some people are hoping or speculating to be able to put T-Rex in random places. This is based on a tweet that says, quote, my favorite part of the patent is this T-Rex. I hope future spectacles let me put a T-Rex in random places. <laughs> and there's a picture in this tweet of a T-Rex walking next to some cars. I wonder if that was just of the HoloLens, because the HoloLens has that ability oh, to really? add a T-Rex. Yeah, we talked about that a few months ago, I think. It could be. Just put them everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Next, in the UK, a woman sheared her alpacas to have fun hairdos to celebrate her 10th year of breeding them, and one of them looks like a dinosaur. In the <laughs> photos, it's kind of stegosaurus-like, like, like what, how we've seen cats styled, some oh, of yeah. them. They have bumps of fur along its back. Uh, another one looks like a poodle, and another one has a mohawk. <laughs> Not quite as fun. Actually, the poodle is pretty entertaining. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> Did she shave it all the way down like they do with poodles? Yes. Oh, man. Well, because otherwise the alpacas are too hot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I also saw uh, some great dinosaur cake designs. So McComb shared a recipe for an Arlo from the Good Dinosaur Cake. And it requires, among other things, sugar paste, brown and green food coloring pens, and a bamboo skewer to help cut some of the shapes. It looks like a lot of work, so many steps in that recipe. But the end result is gorgeous. If the right person's doing it, I could see like some Pinterest fail moments <laughs> happening <laughs> after hours of work. That's true. <laughs> that would be how mine looked if I tried this. Yeah, don't, just let's not try. <laughs> we'll just admire. Yeah. There's speculation that dinosaurs are now the new unicorns. So It's a weird thing to say. Well, it's, <laughs> I guess because unicorns used to be on it, or maybe they still are on anything. I've never really kept up with the unicorn fad, but... <laughs> It was a headline that caught my attention. So. <laughs> so the debrief put together a list of 12 dinosaur trendy items. Some of the dinosaur items include a dinosaur applique short sleeve t-shirt. There's dinosaur socks, a Kate Spade dinosaur keychain, which costs 60 pounds, dinosaur sweatshirts and dinosaur graphic tees, and a coach dinosaur wristlet in leather as well as a dinosaur iPhone 7 case. I say, bring on the dinosaurs, get get more of that stuff. Maybe some more uh, dinosaur clothes. We talked about this huh? with the children's clothes and, the, and girls want more dinosaur things, but adults also. Yeah. More than just the graphic tees. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's interesting. I don't remember unicorns being that big, but I might not be the right market for that. Probably not. Yeah. Because <laughs> I didn't notice any of these dinosaur things either since they're all targeted at women that care about fashion mm -hmm. and i'm neither of those things you don't want a, a kate spade dinosaur keychain i don't even know what kate spade is it sounds familiar is that like a jewelry company or it's something brand okay <laughs> <laughs> anyway speaking of dinosaur swag popular science shop is selling a 3d neon dinosaur light for 30 dollars. it's normally 60 dollars, but it's currently on sale it's 10 inches tall and stands on a dark plexiglass stand, and it's a very detailed light. It looks like a 3D model wireframe Yeah, type it looks of thing. really cool. I'm tempted to get it. Yeah. It comes in seven colors, including green. I don't know if it's still going to be on sale when this airs or not. That's, yeah. It, it didn't be. have a, a sale date on yeah. it, so we shall see. But it's really impressive. Garrett and I took a glass blowing class once years ago. And it Real was neon. really difficult to shape. Yeah, we made neon sign, but sort it of. was pretty simple bends. We were trying to make music notes, but you couldn't tell. Well, we, we pivoted. It started out as music <laughs> notes, and it turned into three balls. I don't know. <laughs> did you... I don't know if you actually contributed any class to that. I think I most did. of yours collapsed. No, nah, I made at least one. Okay. You probably made one. <laughs> But this, I think, is made out of LED light, it looked like, that okay. kind of luminescent filament stuff. Okay. 
because otherwise there's no way they could do that for 60 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and as a quick reminder, we've got our new Teespring store up with lots of really cool stuff like mugs, clothes, a bag, a onesie. We've got, <laughs> we do span. Don't forget that onesie. Yeah, it spans the entire age range. So it's important to mention the onesie because there's a onesie for babies. Then there's like a toddler t-shirt. Then there's kids sweatshirts and t-shirts. And then there's adult sweatshirts, t-shirts, tank tops. I wanted to put yoga pants on there because I know Teespring has those, but I couldn't find it <laughs> in the options. And then there's also like a tote bag and a mug. So anything you want with our logo on it. We don't have any awesome graphic designs of different dinosaurs yet. So they all just have the T-Rex. But if you like T-Rex, like a lot of people do, and you like our podcast, which hopefully you do if you're hearing this, <laughs> then <laughs> I think it would be a pretty cool thing to have. Yep. And we hope to in the future have more designs. Yeah, yeah. We've already gotten a request for a Parasaurolophus <laughs> in all those sizes, I think. <laughs> <Pretty> <laughs> nice. And now on to our Dinosaur of the Day at Montosaurus slash Anna to Titan, which was a request from Marcos via Patreon. So thanks, Marcos. It was a hadrosaurid, you know, duck build, dinosaur that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Western North America. And there's two known species. There's Edmontosaurus regalis and Edmontosaurus enectens. The type species is Edmontosaurus regalis, and that species name means regal or king-sized. Edmontosaurus, the genus, is named after Edmonton, the capital of Alberta, and the fossils were first found in southern Alberta. So there's a long history here. Obviously, it's, it's had multiple names. It's more than just Anna to Titan. Edmontosaurus regalis was named in 1917 by Lawrence Lamb based on two specimens found in Alberta that George Sternberg had found in 1912 and 1916. However, there are a lot of species that are now classified as Edmontosaurus that were named earlier, including Edmontosaurus enectens, which Charles Marsh named in 1892, and that had originally been called Plausaurus, and then Trachodon, then Anatosaurus, and now Anatosaurus and Anatotitan are now usually considered to be synonyms of Edmontosaurus. But we'll get to that. <laughs> Charles Marsh named Clausaurus Anectens in 1892 based on a partial skull roof and skeleton and a second skull and skeleton. These specimens were collected in 1891 by John Bell Hatcher in Wyoming. And Marsh described in 1889 a lower jaw that Hatcher found in the Lance Formation, and he named that Trichodon longiceps, and it was larger than a previous find by Edward Cope. Yes, this is a Bone Wars dinosaur, which is why there is so much history and yeah. stuff around it. <laughs> and so many names, because they both overnamed dinosaurs. Yep. In 1904, a second mostly complete skeleton was found in the Hell Creek Formation by Oscar Hunter, a rancher in Montana. He and a friend debated over whether what he found was a fossil, and Hunter wanted to show that it was brittle, and therefore not a fossil, stone, by kicking off the tops of the vertebrae, Ugh. which Barnum Brown, who eventually collected the fossil, was understandably unhappy about. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what he said when he was unhappy. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so what happened is Alfred Senseva, another rancher, bought the specimen from Hunter for a pistol and then sold it to Brown who excavated it in 1906. And in 1907, this and Cope's earlier specimen was mounted next to each other at the American Museum of Natural History and named Trichodon mirabilis. Hadrosaurids weren't well known at the time. And after Marsh died in 1897, Clausaurus enectens was classified as a number of genera. Got Clausaurus, but then it was at one point Thespaceus and Trichodon. And textbooks and encyclopedias mention the difference between Clausaurus, that was Iguanodon-like, and Hadrosaurus, which had the duckbill. But in 1902, Hatcher said Clausaurus enectens was synonymous with the duckbilled skull Hadrosaurid, and he thought nearly all the then-known Hadrosaurids were synonyms of Trachodon. This included a long list, but <laughs> some of them are Hadrosaurus and Thespesius. Uh, then in 1910, new fossils from Canada and Montana showed more diversity in hadrosaurids, and Charles Gilmore said in 1915 that Clausaurus enectens was the same as the Specius occidentalis. Between 1902 and 1915, two more Clausaurus enectens specimens were found. The first was 
known as the Trachodon Mummy, found in 1908 by Charles Sternberg and his sons in Wyoming. And Sternberg was actually working for the British Museum of Natural History at the time, but Henry Fairfield Osborne bought the specimen for $2,000 for the American Museum of Natural History. And then in 1910, the Sternbergs found a second similar specimen in the same area, and it had skin impressions on it, and they sold that one to the Senckenberg Museum in Germany, where it still is. Lawrence Lamb described Trachodon Sowenae in 1902 based on a lower jaw found in Alberta, and it was described as having been assigned to Edmontosaurus regalis, but not many people think this is right. <laughs> and Trachodon is now considered to be a dubious genus. There were two other species included with Edmontosaurus in the 1920s, but were initially called the Speceus. In 1926, Charles Sternberg named a new specimen, the Speceus Saskatchewanensis, and in 1942, Lowell and Wright decided, enough, we want to simplify the taxonomy of chrysalis hadrosaurids, and they named a new genus, Anatosaurus, to include a whole bunch of species. And this name means duck lizard. So assigned to this new genus were Thespeceus trachodon longiceps, which, again, based on a lower jaw only, and a new species called Anatosaurus copi, that name came from the two skeletons on display at the American Museum of Natural History that were previously known as Trachodon, but uh, at some point became known as Declonius. Anatosaurus became known as this classic duck-billed dinosaur, and as you can imagine, it was basically a wastebasket taxon for hadrosaurs. Yeah, it was called the duck dinosaur. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good name. <laughs> so Anatosaurus copi which at one point was Anatotitan, then eventually became Edmontosaurus enectans. Does that mean Anatotitan means giant duck? I think it would. <laughs> Maybe. I actually That's didn't. That's pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, that one was found in 1882 by Dr. J.L. Wortman and R.S. Hill, and they found it for Edward Cope. They found it in the Hell Creek Formation. Cope described it as Declonius mirabilis. This is the American Museum of Natural History one. It was a combination of Declonius, a hadrosaur cope had named earlier based on teeth, and Trachodon mirabilis, which was also named based on teeth. But that one was named by Joseph Leedy, and Cope thought that Leedy did not properly characterize Trachodon and had abandoned it. So he assigned the older Trachodon species to the new genus Declonius. Leedy had found that Trachodon was based on multiple types of dinosaurs, and he was working on revising the genus, but he hadn't formally declared anything. And then Lamb, in 1917, when he was naming the two Edmontosaurus specimens, described them as similar to Declonius mirabilis. In the 1970s and 80s, Michael K. Brett Sermon re-examined this material and found that Anatosaurus enectans, the type species, was actually a species of Edmontosaurus, and he said that Anatosaurus copi was different enough to be a separate genus. This was part of his graduate work, and it's not considered to be an official publication by the International Commission of Zoological Nomenclature, but it got out there and got people thinking. And in 1990, Brett Sermon and Ralph Chapman designed a new genus for Anatosaurus copi called Anatotitan. Then Anatosaurus saskatchewensis and Anatosaurus edmontoni were reassigned to Edmontosaurus. Anatosaurus longiceps became Anatotitan, either as a second species or synonym of Anatotitan copi. Because the type species Anatosaurus enectans became Edmontosaurus, Anatosaurus is no longer considered to be a junior synonym. At this time, at this point in time only, there were considered to be three species of Edmontosaurus. They had Regalis, Anectins, which included Anatosaurus edmontoni, and Saskatchewensis. Then, in 2007, Nicholas Campione and David Evans said that there were only two valid Edmontosaurus specimens, Regalis and Anectins, and they found that Anatotitan copi was a synonym of Edmontosaurus anectans. The Anatotitan skull was actually a mature Edmontosaurus anectans, they said. In 2011, Campione and Evans looked at all known Edmontosaurus skulls and found that the shape of the skulls changed as it grew. The skull became longer and flatter, and this led to mistakes in classification, and according to them, meant that the Speceus edmontoni, aka Edmontosaurus enectans, was more likely a subadult uh, Edmontosaurus regalis, and also that Edmontosaurus saskatchewensis represented juveniles, Edmontosaurus enectans were subadults, and Anatotitan copi were mature adults. It's also possible that Trachodon longiceps is also a synonym of Edmontosaurus enectans. There are some Edmontosaurus specimens that were found in Alaska and western Texas that have since been reassigned away from Edmontosaurus to other genera. There's Ugrinolic and Cretosaurus, and I believe we've talked about both of those. Yeah, I think so. When they were reassigned, because it was pretty recent. So Edmontosaurus 
now that we have covered the history, it's a sorolophene hadrosaurid, which is the group that had solid crests or fleshy combs on their head instead of large hollow crests like Lambiosaurinae. It's one of the largest hadrosaurids. It grew up to 39 feet or 12 meters long and weighed four tons. It's possible it even got larger than that, up to 49 feet or 15 meters long and weighed nine metric tons. And this is based on a couple specimens that are still being studied. However, very large in Montosaurus were probably rare due to environmental stress or disease, and also they were prey. <laughs> There's a lot of bone beds that have been found. One in the Lance Formation has remains from 10 to 25,000 at Montosaurus. Really? Apparently. That's crazy. I wonder if it's that many bones or that many individuals, because that would be an insane number of individuals. Yeah. But based on these bone beds, it's possible that Montosaurus lived in groups and they may have even migrated. So Phil Arbell and Eric Snively said in 2008 that Amontosaurus may have migrated annually 1,600 miles or 2,600 kilometers round trip between Alaska and Alberta, but not everybody agrees with this. And actually, Chissimee and others in 2012 found that hadrosaur remains in more polar regions were from groups that lived there all the time and didn't migrate. So it's kind of up for debate. Yeah, that's a tough one to measure. Definitely. Uh, Edmontosaurus was an herbivore, and it could move on both two and four legs. It probably walked on two legs when moving fast, and it had really powerful leg muscles. It could run up to 28 miles per hour, or 45 kilometers per hour. Didn't we see a recent study that was looking at another hadrosaur, and it said the fastest thing was galloping? I can't remember. Uh, that sounds familiar, but I can't remember which one. And I don't think they looked at stresses on the body and things. There were a couple kind of limiting features. No, no, it was hopping. That's what it was. It worked out to be hopping. Oh, that was for the Edmontosaurus. They it looked was. at it as kangaroo hopping, but it didn't seem feasible to actually yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. There might have been for other dinosaurs too, but I did just read this about Edmontosaurus specifically. <laughs> I love that idea. Yeah. Edmontosaurus, they were bulky and they had a long flat tail and obviously a head with a duck-like beak. And they held their tail horizontally. The tail had ossified tendons, so it was ramrod straight. This stiff tail may have helped them with balancing, especially when they're changing between two and four legs. And hadrosaurs, unfortunately, sometimes are known as the cows of the Cretaceous. But it turns out they may have been more powerful than we realized because they had these large back legs and these muscly tails and they can run faster than a T-Rex. But horses of the Cretaceous does not have alliteration. So <laughs> I still vote for cows of the Cretaceous. And they were prey, so I understand. <laughs> The largest known Edmontosaur skull is 46 inches or 118 centimeters long. And Edmontosaurus, as I mentioned, they had these comb-like crests on their head and triangular skulls. Its head is bigger than that troodontid that was just found in China. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Some Edmontosaurus skulls were so well preserved that scientists could make casts of the brain cavity. And they found that it had a proportionately small brain, which isn't too surprising. There's bones around its nasal openings that had deep indentations, which may have held inflatable air sacs. And scientists have found sclerotic rings in the eye sockets and stapes, which is reptilian ear bone, in Edmontosaurus specimens, which are rarely preserved. Edmontosaurus anectens has a longer, less robust skull than Edmontosaurus regalis, and Edmontosaurus regalis comes from an older formation than Edmontosaurus inectans, though they've both been found in the same area. So the older formations there are the Horseshoe Canyon and St. Mary River formations, and the younger ones are Frenchman, Hell Creek, and Lance. The latest Cretaceous. Yeah, they lived till the end. Yeah. <laughs> Edmontosaurus also had a frilly ridge of soft tissue down the center of its neck and back, and they had four fingers in each hand, and the second, third, and fourth digits were about the same length and were put together via a fleshy covering. Their little finger was shorter and not connected to the other three. It had three toes on each foot, and they had hoof-like tips. Cope had originally thought that hadrosaurids were amphibious, based on the lower jaw being weakly connected and thought it might break off if it ate non-aquatic food, but he also thought that the beak was weak, and this turned out not to be true. Turns out their short fingers that hadrosaurids had and the rigid tail were not great for swimming, so... No, they were not really aquatic. But he wasn't the only one who thought that. There's a lot of scientists used to think that Edmontosaurus was aquatic and they ate aquatic plants. They thought that until the 1960s and 70s. And then William Morris in 1970 said that it had a diet like modern ducks and used its beak to filter plants and aquatic invertebrates. But this is now considered to be false. <laughs> Scientists have found skin impressions and possible gut contents of Edmontosaurus. It had this toothless beak, but it was covered in keratin. 
with one of the the mummy at Montessoris at the Senckenberg Museum in Germany has some of this keratinous material on the beak. And it used its beak to cut food. It either cropped it or clamped its jaws on twigs and branches and then stripped off the leaves and shoots. It could eat food on the ground, and it could eat food that was off the ground up to 13 feet or 4 meters. It probably grazed its food, though, based on wear patterns on the teeth. And it had these cheek-like structures so it could keep its food in its mouth. Based on the tooth structure, it probably sliced and ground its food. It had dental batteries, so it had up to 2,000 teeth at the back of its jaws. And it only had teeth in the upper cheeks and the dentaries. It continually replaced its teeth, and they took about half a year to form each. Their teeth grew in columns, and the number of columns depended on the size of the Edmontosaurus. So Edmontosaurus regalis had between 51 and 53 columns, and Edmontosaurus inectans had 52. From the 1980s to early 2000s, it was thought that hadrosaurids could chew by moving their lower jaw backwards and forwards, based on a model by David Vichample in 1984. But in 2008, Casey Holliday and Lawrence Wittmer published a study that found in Montasaurus did not have skull joints that would allow this motion. So a 2009 study by Vincent Williams and others said that there may have been a combination of movements, including an oblique kind of motion. That's like what we talked about last week with Diplodocus. Mm-hmm. There's been reports of gastrolus found in Edmontosaurus inectans. It was called Klausaurus originally that Barnum Brown had found this specimen in 1900. But it's now thought that the gastrolus were actually gravel that washed in after the animal died. The Sternberg mummy specimens, they found two that had preserved tissue, may have had gut contents. Sternberg had reported on carbonized gut contents for the American Museum Natural History specimen, but that one hasn't been described yet. And plant remains in the Senckenberg Museum specimen were described, but it's not that easy to interpret. The plants may have been gut contents, or it's possible they just washed into the animal's carcass after it died. Edmontosaurus inectin specimens have been found with skin impressions, such as, again, the Trachodon mummy, and another specimen nicknamed Dakota. That one was found in 1999 by Tyler Larson in the Hell Creek Formation in North Dakota and announced in 2007. And they found, based on that, that most of the body was covered in scales. Hmm. Not as many specimens with skin impressions have been found for Edmontosaurus regalis, but some specimens have been studied, including one with a soft tissue crest on its head. It's not clear if Edmontosaurus inectans had a crest, and it's also not clear if this crest gave any indication of sexual dimorphism. Edmontosaurus lived all over western North America, and they seemed to prefer coasts and coastal plains. The Lance Formation, where some Edmontosaurus specimens were found, had a bayou setting with tropical conifers and palm trees around hardwood forests and a humid subtropical climate. And they lived among fish and salamanders, turtles, lizards, snakes, shorebirds, even small mammals. They also lived at the same time in place as Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus, because they're one of the last non-avian dinosaurs. As we mentioned, they lived to the end. Edmontosaurus bones were described as having tumors in 2003. There's a bunch of different things, even possibly metastatic cancer. This may have been genetic or from environmental factors. Osteochondrosis has also been found in 2.2% of 224 Edmontosaurus toe bones. These are pits in the bone in places where bones articulate, and this happens when cartilage is not replaced by a bone during growth. It's not clear if that's from genetics or trauma or feeding intensity or other factors. One specimen of Edmontosaurus inectans from South Dakota has tooth marks from small theropods on its lower jaws, and these were partially healed, so maybe the theropods attacked its throat and then it died of its injuries later. Gave its face a little chew. Yeah, that sounds really unpleasant. (laughs) You can also see an adult Edmontosaurus inectans at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It has a theropod bite in its tail, probably from a T-Rex. It died before that bite healed, but did have a bone infection. However, it survived the attack somehow. It either outmaneuvered or outran, or maybe it used its tail as a weapon against the T-Rex. Hmm. You can see two Edmontosaurus specimens at the Museum of the Rockies, and you can also see Edmontosaurus in Dinosaurs in Their Time, an exhibit in the Carnegie Museum. There's two T-Rexes fighting over a carcass. Cool. And our fun fact of the day goes back to Pachypotosauria, which is that potential new name for Sauriscians without theropods. And it was originally proposed by Friedrich von Huhn back in 1914, as I mentioned earlier. But what I didn't say was that when he proposed that name, he was actually using it to group theropods and sauropodomorphs (laughs) into one group. And he also coined the word sauropodomorph. So that's kind of cool. So yeah, he was kind of doing the opposite thing. 
but this isn't the first time that the Soriskian Ornithischian framework has been questioned. It was set up back in the late 1800s, but Bob Bakker in the Dinosaur Heresies in 1986 proposed a different alternate to the dinosaur framework. And what he did was he pulled Herrerasaurids out and put them on their own, and then he gave theropods their own little branch, and he gave a new branch to a group he called Phytodinosauria, which means plant dinosaurs, and that really included everything else. So it effectively separated the herbivores from the carnivores. Hmm. It was part of a larger argument to remove Dinosauria from Reptilia to emphasize their bird-like warm-bloodedness. <laughs> but he said, quote, I proposed this sort of classification in 1975 in an article I published in Scientific American. Most taxonomists, however, have viewed such new terminology as dangerously destabilizing to the traditional well-known scheme that has been with us since the time of Baron Cuvier, end quote. And it's really funny because <laughs> here we are with things being dangerously <laughs> unstabilized. So More heresies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So it is a big problem when you make huge changes like this. But this is 30 years after that. <laughs> Seems to be more well-received, though. Well, there was also... It's still a big debate. Right? I don't know. I haven't seen too much coming out against it. So yeah. the fact that Tom Holtz is on board is, I think, a big step. True. But we'll see. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you want to join our growing community on Patreon, check out our page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.